for a particular situation. So things like logging on requires a form where there's a user ID and password typically that you put in. And after you enter that in, then it accesses the database, make sure that you're who you say you are, and then prepares, for example, your Canvas page that will show your classes and information relating to you. Um, likewise, a Google search. You type in a search term, it returns information about whatever you searched in. And it gets the information from you about what you're interested in seeing from a form. All right. Uh, I want to review briefly um, what we talked about last week concerning forms, and then I want to go forward and talk about HTML5 form controls. Because everything we've talked to up to this point is um, HTML4 um, stuff, which still works. All right? There's nothing wrong with it, but there's some additional capabilities that, is bu that are built into HTML5 that uh, is worth looking at. Um, first thing to remember, and I did grade some of the stuff. Well, I'd grade everything that was turned in as of last evening. Um, few things to remember, this was our little Bing search where we could type in a term in here and click our search button and it would bring up the search results. So we could type in a char term in the, in the text box, click search and it brings up the search results. Key things from this example, number one, the two attributes on the form tag, those are critical. A lot of people completed the form lab, but omitted the action attribute. And the action attribute is necessary because you need to send your form information to a server-side script to be processed. All right? So you need that to actually invoke the process. It's going to do something with the form information. So in our case, we're calling the Bing search engine, and that is the URL that we're calling, Bing slash search. The method is either get or post. And for this class, it's probably best if we focus on get, because that passes the data on the query string, which means that it's visible. So if we did our search here, notice that is the action up to that point. And we can see all the form fields because we can see the query string. We have a text box then named Q. The name is important because the server-side script is expecting certain things to be called certain things. So we have to match what the server-side script is expecting. And in this case, it's expecting Q. So we have to give it Q. So we give it Q by giving a name of Q. And so we'll see everything in our form will be the name that we give the field equals and then the value of the particular form control. Finally, we have a submit button, which actually invokes the, the, the search in this case. Submit means send the data to the URL listed in the action. All right? So this is sort of the basics of form 101. You need a form tag. Think of the form tag as being the envelope around everything that you're going to send the server. Action is necessary. Method is necessary. And then you have your different form controls. In the other example, we didn't tap on to a server-side script, and that might be what confused some students. I simply have an action equals pound sign in this case, because I don't have a server-side script to process this. All right, in your example, in your assignment, there is a server-side script you need to call. Um, still using method of get. This is a little more involved because, first of all, we're doing things as far as accessibility goes and formatting. We put things in a list. Um, and an unordered list, because really that's what a form is. It's a list of stuff that you're sending to the server. And then we style it by getting rid of the bullet points and, and so on. The new tag we, one of the new tags we introduced in this example is the label, which is used for accessibility reasons. 
but it also has benefits as far as styling goes as well. So the label allows screen readers to associate the elements of your form with a description of them. And what ties them together is the for of the label matches up with the ID of the form control. So that way, a screen reader knows that this thing that has an ID of name, the label for it is this guy right here. So it's name. We introduced a couple other form controls, type of password, and that simply doesn't echo the characters back, as you might expect. We have radio buttons. Now with radio buttons, keep in mind that each individual one is going to have its own ID, but they're all going to have the same name. All right. Um, having the same name is what makes them act like a radio button, so that if you click one, the others automatically are turned off. And whatever one is selected, that's the value that gets put on the query string in this case. So rbres, the name, will be ic if this one is selected. We have a checkbox here, type equals checkbox, also has a value. We have a drop down, which consists of a select tag with a list of options. Each option, remember, has something that the script is going to use, and it has the description that the users are going to read to understand what that means. Finally, we have a text area. And then again, we have our submit button. Any questions about what we went over last time? Last couple times. There's a couple other form controls, a couple other types of buttons. There's a reset button, which is used to clear out a form. All right. So in other words, if you click a reset button, it, it takes you back to the, to the results. Now, I'm going to argue, and, and there's people that, uh, you know, I'm not the only one that thinks this, um, but the reset buttons um, are not really a good idea most of the time. And let me tell you why. Let me see. There was, a, there was always a, a thing that really annoyed me on LC's website. Let's see if that's still the case. Let's say I'm going to go search for classes for um, spring semester. Where do you go to do that? My campus? I don't want to log on because I log on as a professor and it acts differently for me. So let's try this. may have to. Does anyone know where you go to search for classes? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, so it is at my campus.
Oh, well. Here's your homework assignment. <laughs> Go and search for classes for spring semester. All right. You'll notice that there are, and, and I'll have to draw it. This will be like, an, this will be like they do in the courtroom, right? They can't have cameras in the courtroom, so they draw pictures. The form looks like this. There's a bunch of stuff, like department that you're searching for, so CISS, course number that you're searching for, a professor that you want to have. Interestingly enough, it doesn't say that you don't want a particular professor, but I guess that's the way it goes. The days of the week that you're interested in, like maybe you, maybe you know you work Tuesdays and Thursdays, so you have to get a Monday and Wednesday class or something. They have all these fields. They have a search and a reset button. So if you sit here and think about what you're interested in taking and fill all that out, if you're not real careful and you go down and you click that button, guess what it does? It clears out everything you've entered in so far. And then you have to go and enter it again, and hopefully you'll remember to click the right button this time. The reset button is dangerous because if you click it by accident, you're causing people to lose the data that they've entered so far. All right. Um, What's particularly bad in this case is the reset button looks the same as the send button or the search button. And in fact, the reset button, I think, is even a little bigger. So your eye is drawn to it a little bit more. Because there's a possibility that people may accidentally click on it, I avoid this, the, the reset button. Because typically, when do people, you know, I mean, I guess rarely it could come to benefit the user, but I would think more often than benefiting the user is going to burn the user by having them select something they don't want. So I generally avoid the reset button on forms. Just refresh the page, exactly, and that would do the same thing. Um, there's also a plain button, which is type equals button, and you can use that to invoke JavaScript. And when we talk about JavaScript, we'll probably talk about those buttons. All right. So that's HTML4 form controls. There's also a whole set of HTML5 form controls. And let me talk about like, why these controls came into being. All right. Text boxes under HTML4 are just that, a box that you can put text in. What kind of text? Any text anything that you can type in on the keyboard. All right? But in some cases, there are certain restrictions about the text that you type in. For example, if it asks me for my birth date, it has to be in a certain format. It has to be month, day, year, or whatever. If I ask for phone number, it has to be in a certain format, right? Area code, exchange, phone number, and so on. So these are text fields. They're not drop downs. You couldn't have a drop down for phone number where you listed every possible phone number and have the person pick it from that. That doesn't make sense. All right. Um, likewise with dates. Not feasible to have a drop down for that. And yet, they're not plain text boxes. So they're entered in, but they're not plain text boxes. What you had to do in HTML4 is write JavaScript to validate your form. So you would write JavaScript, you would, you would use a language called JavaScript that we haven't covered yet, but essentially what it would do is it would look at the data that you've entered in the form and make sure that it fits the right format. All right. With HTML5 form controls, you actually, uh, some of that, uh, there, there's some new form controls that do, do some of that for you, so you don't absolutely have to write any JavaScript. So let's look at some of those form controls. Most, if not all, of the new uh, form controls in HTML5 are simply variations of the text boxes. In other words, they are, they are specialized versions of the text boxes. Yeah.
I haven't gotten there yet, so. There you go, HTML5 input types. Ah, here we go. First of all, if you say input type equals number, that will mean you can only type a number in there. So if there was a form, control S for your age. All right. If you used a regular text box, it would simply, um, you could type anything in. And you'd have to write JavaScript to ensure that you typed in a number. Whereas, if the browser is HTML5 compatible, you can't type anything in. And you get a little error message that says, please enter a number. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll see, we'll see a, a variety of other things. Now, the problem with this is... And this will depend on what version of Internet Explorer we have to see if I can demonstrate this problem. We have a new enough version of Internet Explorer that fixed that problem. But there are certain versions of Internet Explorer, nine and earlier, all right, that don't recognize the type as being number. All right. Now what happens if we have an old version of the browser, or if one of our users has an old version of the browser? It simply treats it like a regular text box. So you're really no worse off than you were before. So if you say type equals number and the browser doesn't have HTML5 compatibility, um, then you're really no worse off and you would still have to write JavaScript. So for a period of time until we're, we're sure that pretty much everyone's browser implements HTML5, you probably need to write if you use the HTML5 tags, you probably also need to write client-side validation um, in JavaScript. How do you know what supports what? Which browsers support what? We can actually look at a chart. This chart allows us to look up and shows which browsers better support HTML5. Can I use this is the one that I was actually looking for. Can I use The color input type. That's not supported in IE 11 even, where it is supported in these other versions of the browser. We'll look at the color input type in a minute. Well, actually, let's look at it now. All right. This being Chrome, which supports this input type, 
we can enter a color this way by clicking in that and we can actually pick a color. Say, so yeah, that's my favorite color. I can click OK and it selected that color for me. All right. So you could use something like this if you're allowing users to customize their page. What color do you want the background of your page? And then you could do something with that and use that in your CSS code if you wanted to. All right. However, apparently Internet Explorer does not support that. So notice it just is a plain text box and I can type anything in there. And I click submit query and it thinks my favorite color is that, which obviously doesn't make sense. So tools like this can I use are valuable because it allows you to look and it allows you to see which browsers are compatible and which browsers are not compatible with this. All right. That brings up a whole interesting question of like how far back do you have to support browsers? I mean browsers HTML, uh, browsers prior to these might not support it. Um, that's a judgment call and you have to look at really at every project and as time goes on you can assume people have newer browsers but there's always going to be some of your users that don't have newer browsers and a good website shouldn't break for those people so again keep in mind that the color input type if you do not have a browser that supports it it will act like a plain old text box and you could via JavaScript do validation to make sure that um, what they typed in there was a legitimate color. All right. What are some of the other input types? Here's a date. You can click that and get a date picker if you wanted to pick a particular date. Or you could type in a particular date that way. A range is when there's a minimum or maximum. So, for example, if you were saying that, um, you know, if I was entering grades on a particular assignment, all right, um, if I was enter entering your percentage, the percentage is going to be between 0 and 100, right? So, this actually has a slider that shows how many points you have. Now, This isn't particularly useful as it stands because the slider doesn't really show you how many points there are. So, for example, if you got a, uh, a 95, you know, is that there or is that there? Sometimes what people have done is via JavaScript, they'll show the number alongside of it to make it more effective. This would be good for something like, you know, how much do you like this... Um, you know, how, how much do you like this band? A lot or a little bit? Where it's more qualitative. Um, like, yeah, I like them a lot. Yeah, I hate them. Where you're not dealing with precise numbers. All right, you can actually enter a month. You know, maybe you're not interested in a person's birth, uh, birth date, but maybe what month and year that you were born in. which week of the year, enter in a time, an email address, a search field. 
and the one that you mentioned, the telephone number. So if you type it in, the telephone number, um, it will it will work. Whereas if you enter in something that isn't a valid telephone number, yep, this isn't working. Oh, okay. Interesting. No, it tells only supported in Safari 8. Interesting. Type URL and so on down the line. So these specialized, these specialized um, input controls uh, can come in really handy, all right, because um, it allows you then to specifically say um, what kind of data is going to be filled in. The old HTML text, HTML4 text box accepted any kind of text. These are more specialized versions. The other thing that you can do, and I didn't see the example here, but you can specify that something is required. Yeah. So, notice there, it allows me to enter an empty field. Whereas if I change that to say required, all right, Oh, I was still running this in IE. I thought I was, I thought I was in, um, I thought I was in Chrome. Here is required. It enters and please fill out that field. So we've already seen a case here of of browser. Oh, okay. Actually, or what was that? Yeah, that was um, IE that wasn't working. All right. The point is, is that these controls are still relatively new. And you have to use them with caution. And I think it's too early in the game to, to assume that everyone is going to have an HTML5, uh, complete HTML5 browser compatibility. And therefore, it probably would be a good idea to write JavaScript to validate stuff. It's a little extra work, but um, at, you know, it, it will give, uh, you know, it will provide beneficial at some point um, when um, we can assume that everyone has HTML5 browsers and not. Um, and not uh, have to do the validation on our own. Questions at this point? All right, our next topic is tables. And I want to start that today. All right, and we will, we will finish it up um, either, um, either Wednesday or we might go into next week. Um, after tables, this is week 12, uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time on JavaScript. We don't teach uh, a lot of JavaScript in this class, but we teach enough to sort of um, give you an idea of, of um, the capabilities of JavaScript. All right. Tables are for columns and, and, and rows of numbers. In other words, if you think of an Excel worksheet, an Excel worksheet has columns, it has rows, um, it has numbers in the columns and rows, it has headings for the columns, and maybe even headings for the rows. In the old days, before CSS was popular, people would take the table tag and subvert it to do layouts. All right. In other words, if you think of a structure with rows and columns, if 
if you stretch out those rows and columns and say I'm going to make just a big table that has a couple rows and a couple columns, you might be tempted to say, well, I'll put my navigation in here, I'll put my company's logo here, I'll put a header here, and this will be the content of my site. So back in the old days, that's how people did layouts. They used the table tag. Um, if you never did HTML coding back then, then forget I even mentioned that. All right? But I, uh, every class, I have a couple people that sort of are old school web developers. And that's how they learn to do layout. And that was appropriate at the time, but now that's not a good idea. You can do so much more with CSS, and therefore you should use CSS to do the layout. All right? So I only mention that if there's someone that's been doing web development for a while and they think, whoa, tables, I can use that for my layouts. Don't use tables to make your layout. Use tables for what they're meant to be, and that is tables of data. All right, let's say that I have, I wanted to, to maybe make a table showing the average temperature um, in different cities ac across the country. So let's say I go and I make a web page. And I want to do Cleveland Los Angeles and Juneau, Alaska. And then maybe I want to do the average temperature in January, February, and March. So I want to make a little spreadsheet like this. And maybe the average temperature in January is 15 degrees in Cleveland, 20 degrees in February, and, and 29 degrees in March. In Juneau, maybe it is 1 degree in in January, 10 degrees in February, 16 degrees in March. In Los Angeles, maybe at 60 degrees in January, 68 degrees in February, 72 in March. All right. If I make a page that looks like that, which you can't see, all right? If I make a page that looks like that, what's it going to look like when I view it in the browser? It's going to look like one line, all right? Why is it going to look like one line? Because HTML, the browsers, get rid of the white space. So in other words, I, if I try to format my code in my HTML file like this, it's not going to work. And we found out that that's a good thing, right? Because then you can show nesting and you can space things out. It doesn't really matter. You can create your web page in a way that is easy for you to go and change it. So sure enough, if we save this and we view this in the browser, is one line, all right, as predicted. This is where the table uh, comes in. This is where the table tags come in. And we're going to study today, we're going to introduce the four basic table tags. And then we will talk more about um, tables next time. There is, by the way, an additional form tag that I forgot that you can use to group fields. And it's called a field set. I just thought of that now.
a field set allows you to group form fields together. So maybe on a form there's a place for your information and the spouse, your spouse's information. fields that allows you to group them together to just make it more clear that the top three fields are about you, the bottom three fields are about your spouse. All right, That could be very useful. You could have used that, it's not required, but you could use that in the pizza example. For, for example, to have things like pers you know, uh, customer information, which would be like the name and phone number. Topping information, which would be the list of toppings, or, or pizza options that would include the size and the toppings or whatever. All right. Okay, anyhow, back to tables. There's four tags relating to tables that we're going to study today. There's the table tag itself. There is the TR tag, which stands for table rows. Then there are THs and TDs. THs stand for table header. TD stands for table data. All right. And the simplest tables that you can make will just contain those tags. The table tag simply says, here's the start of the table, here's the end of the table. A table is comprised of a set of rows. So in this case, we have one, two, three, four rows. So I'll go in and I'll put those four rows in right off the bat. Each row then, probably should put city over here. Each row then consists of a series of cells. Just like, you know, you could think of Excel, you know, or columns. All right. So this row has four columns. A column that has the word city in it, a column that has the word January, a column that has the word Feb, and March. Now, this is an actual data. This is, these are labels. These are headers that say what the column means. So I'm going to use a th tag for that. So rows in the table are tr. Fields within the row, or the, the, the columns within the row, are either THs or TDs. THs meaning that they're headers, TDs meaning that they're data. So city, January, February, March. And then we're going to have or TDs. And the order matches up. In other words, uh, the first TD or TH in each row becomes the first column. The second TH or TD becomes the second column, and so on down the line.
All right. So I can get rid of that mess now. And that's my table. This is about as simple of a table as you can get. Each column ha or each uh, row has four columns, and there are four rows. Table tag goes around everything. I then define the rows. Within each row, I define the columns that exist in those rows. Each column is either a TH or TD. Yes? Okay, that, that's an excellent question. Um, let's, let's view this first and we'll come back to your question. All right. So let's go and view what this looks like in our browser now and this will look a lot better than we had before. All right. A couple observations. How wide did it make each column? It, it made it wide enough to hold the biggest piece of data. So for example, Los Angeles is the biggest thing in the first column. So therefore, Los Angeles determines the width. It's as wide as Los Angeles is. Uh, Jan, Feb, and Mar, those are the biggest things in their column, the headers. So Jan, it, the, for the second column is as wide as January, J-A-N is. The second column is as wide as F-E-B and M-A-R. All right. Okay. That's a default behavior. Remember, in all our HTML, we have a default behavior, and then there's ways that we can change it based on our CSS. So maybe we don't want it to look like this. Maybe we want it to be to have more space or whatever. Now to your question, what if we didn't have a number of same number of columns, like this. All right. Where do you think 29 is going to line up? It's going to line up under February. So really, literally what it does is the first TH or TD is the first column, the second is the second, third is the third, and so on. So if there was really a missing row, a missing column here, like, I don't know, we didn't have weather records for February, all right? goofy example, all right, but, yeah, true, then it would look like this. Yeah, let, yeah, exactly. Let's go and let's add one to Juno. Now, what if we didn't have, if we really didn't have February data for that? Well, what we could do is we could do this, which we could leave a blank row, or we could put in NBSP, which stands for non-breaking space, which is how you can force the browser to recognize some white space and actually put a blank there. And now that would pad it out and have a missing thing here. The other thing you can do, and again, it doesn't really make sense in this example, but you can give a call span. Like maybe, for example, this is um, maybe 15 is the a average of January and February combined. We don't have it separated for January and February. I, I know, it's a goofy example, but for other data, it might make more sense. That's how you merge cells, exactly.
Oh, it did. Yeah, it did. It just didn't center it. That's what I was expecting it to do. But yeah, yeah, it merges it together. Yeah, these are sort of the, some of the variations on tables that you uh, that you get. Um, the most basic examples, again, the, the 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 simplest examples typically have the same number of uh, columns in each row. You know, you're not even late for when the class started. You're late for when the class ended, because <laughs> we should. Okay, sure. All right. All right. So, that's the basic design for a table. All right. And with just these tags, you can do an awful lot of tables. In other words, most of the tables that you use, these tags are enough to get you through. Now, there's a couple of issues with tables, though. First of all, we might want them to look differently. This isn't terribly exciting. We could do things to help the user all right, uh, read and understand the table. For example, we could use different colors. Maybe make the line of headers be one color all right, and the line of data to be another uh, number. One thing that you can do with some tables as well is alternate the colors of the, of the data lines. That's especially useful if you have very long data lines, like if we are extended to this to 12 months. All right. Um, your eye has a tendency to travel up or down as it goes across the long width of page. So if you have a very wide table, what's useful is alternating the colors. So maybe you have, you have like a white and a light gray. That helps the person keep their eye focused on the one row at a time. All right. All these things are CSS issues. So next time we'll focus on the CSS of tables. And we'll also talk about some of the extra tags that you get with tables. And lastly, we'll talk about accessibility. Because again, for us, it's obvious. What does this number represent? Juno for March. Our eyes tell us that. We look up to see the, the, the column that it's in. We look across to see the row that it's in. But someone that's blind with a screen reader just reading the data to them, they're just going to hear the number 16. And just like with the form, there needs to be a way to associate the field with what the field means, there's a way to um, associate um, a row um, or a field with a row and a column that it belongs to. So people that are visually impaired can get a sense of, of where that data comes from. All right. Then there's a couple other miscellaneous tags that are sometimes useful as well that we can talk about. So that's what we'll do on Wednesday. We'll probably be able to wrap that up then. All right, we'll see you up in lab.